You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again on Education Wednesday. I know some of you, it's your favorite day on the network. Me, I can't choose. They're all my children. I like every day equally. But Education Wednesday, certainly a fun one. And it means it's time once again for Options Boot Camp. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. As well as, of course, from the ever scintillating Options Insider radio network reminding you of course hey if you like what you hear do keep rating and reviewing clearly new people are discovering the show literally every day out there so we love to see the influx of new people it's literally what this show was designed for to help you newcomers come to grips with these crazy things called options if you like what you hear rate and review on your platform of choice it does help of course also a reminder for those of you out there just coming in through boot camp you're missing a whole world of content it's all there it's available free on every platform under the sun pretty much a close to a dozen shows that you could sink your teeth into covering all aspects of the options world, more education like options, playbook radio, some more active trading stuff like the option block or futures option stuff like this week in futures options, the crypto rundown for crypto options, you name it. We got a show about it, volatility views, all sorts of fun out there. So wherever you're listening to this, make sure you upgrade to the full network feed. It's right there, right next to boot camp. You can't miss it. And of course, if you need even more in your lives, and we know some of you do, you want to get exclusive shows like great pro Q&As because let's face it, you have questions. We get it. We can't tackle them all on Options Bootcamp every week. You guys have a lot of many and varied and far-reaching questions. Then our pro Q&A sessions are for you. We allow you to pick the brains of the greatest minds in the world of options and derivatives. Of course, Unusual Activity Show every Friday. Live access to Bootcamp so you could come mock Dan live during the show. As well as, of course, live access to everything else we do throughout the week. And great giveaways. Folks just tweeting out. A lot of them got their pro trading crates recently from our giveaways out there. Those are awesome. Each one of those are completely bespoke. So we create a custom crate for you. <laughs> Filled with the legion of goodies that is overflowing our vault. Remember, we've been running this network for oh, 15 plus years. We've amassed some pretty awesome stuff from the world of options. And we like you. So we give it to our pro members. So theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. To learn more about all that, of course, for all you cool kids, slash secret club. And you know what? He's not one of the cool kids, but let's welcome him on anyway. He is the black-hatted one himself. Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, also the author of one or two or maybe half a dozen options-oriented tomes. Mr. P, welcome back to the show, sir. It is wonderful to be back, as it always is, my friend. And um, we got cool stuff to talk about today. I'm pretty excited. Cool stuff indeed. And also, speaking of cool stuff, we also think it's pretty cool when you folks take the time to rate us, just like Stunt3001 did on iTunes. He said, five stars, great information, exclamation points. He says, I really enjoy listening to this as I feel like I'm always learning. Well, there you go. That's what we aim to please there. We aim to teach Stunt3001. He says, please keep it going. 
Side note is you guys use great microphones. <laughs> so as far as podcasts, you're really, really easy to hear and listen to. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you there, Stunt 3001. We put a lot of effort into the show, obviously, and on the production side as well. It's funny you should say that because right before the show, Dan and I were just talking about what new microphone to get for him. <laughs> so, Dan, there you go. Stunt 3001. He likes your old one. All right. Hey, you know, there you go. I'll cancel my uh, Amazon order. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. As we keep on rolling, it is time for a very special edition of the Options Drills. Holy moot! Time for our favorite pastime, Option Drills. We're going to take the strategies learned during the show and teach you how they can be employed to achieve a specific objective. Do you hear me? Yes, sir! All right, everybody, welcome to the options drill. This is where we go above and beyond. You know, the basic training is to explain some basic options concept or technique to you folks and how you can utilize it in your own portfolio. But options drills will go a little bit above and beyond tackling some other concepts, explain maybe how we do things, how you should approach uh, the options market, certain strategies, how to utilize them, or in this case, really getting the pulse a lot of cool things from the world of options. So, Dan, today we're going to talk about your trader survey results, which I got to admit are, are pretty interesting and also pretty comprehensive. So before we dive into it, let, let's start at the top. What are we talking about? What is this trader survey we're looking at here? Yeah, Mark. So I was talking with uh, some of our team members over here and we're like, you know what? <clears throat> we have got some super uh, smart traders here. Uh, you know, that are our student traders. There's some who they attend our mastermind. They do one-on-one -on -one coaching with us for a year. Some of them are really, really great. And we want to hear what their thoughts are. Um, and I, we figured that the rest of the community would want to hear what the thoughts are too. And so we did sort of like, oh, I don't know, I guess we can call it like crowdsource, um, you know, bit of information here. And and we we polled the market taker community and asked them a series of questions, got their responses and shared it with our community. And it's really, really telling. It's going to end up helping everybody to um, just get, get a handle on what, you know, the, the smarter than average trader thinks. Smarter than your average bear. All right, let's get into it then with this, uh, this trader, community survey so you just did this recently this was just completed recently right dan yeah yeah this is completed uh, a couple weeks ago so let's let's get into some of these results because there's a lot of this and then maybe you could send it at the end tell folks where if they want to sink their teeth into it for themselves see all this data nice graphs go along with this this is a nice presentation dan if i do say so myself so i tip my cap to you sir yeah there's there's really really good stuff in it well, it's your survey. I was going to pick some stuff, but where do you want to start? It's your survey, sir. All right. Well, let's uh, <clears throat> let's start at the beginning. So, um, I mean, I guess just to lay the groundwork for for the listeners here to see, you know, who we're talking about, whose results these are. Uh, Fifty four percent have been trading for more than five years, and then twenty two percent. We're trading two to five years. So we're talking about, you know, at least 75 percent of the respondents have, you know, like they, they didn't just show up yesterday and they're, you know, just throwing darts at the wall. Like they, they've got some good ideas as to know what they're talking about. Right. Um, and then, you know, like we asked some of this general information sort of about who they are, you know, just for this person so that we can show that, like. These are folks who know what they're doing. Um, let's see, people who spend m more than an hour a day trading, that comes out to, oh, what does this come out to? For uh, more than 60% spend more than an hour a day trading, and uh, about 23, 24% spend at least half the day, if not the full day trading. Um. Let's see here. How did you learn to trade? So this is actually kind of interesting as well. 37% <clears throat> took online classes. 
That's the biggest category. The little over 37% took online classes, which is kind of, you know, with today's world, it's the only way to do it. And and that's not even just being post-pandemic where more people are at home. That's the fact that like there's not as big a trading floor as there used to be anymore. Like the trading floor is like I learned on the trading floor. You learned on the trading floor, Mark. People can't really do that anymore. We were down when we were at the mastermind at the CBOE. We uh, we went down for a tour of, the, of their new trading floor. And it's, oh, geez, uh, <clears throat> maybe 5% the size. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. So I'm kind of holding off because I don't, I don't want that bit of disappointment when you see it finally, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, you know, there will be some of that, but it's it's pretty and it's about as high tech as it gets. It man. does look much more airy. There's actually windows and lights. It's not in the bowels of the earth anymore the way the old one felt. <laughs> Yes, it's got like a, you know, clean look to it. Uh, you know, you can see. Um, yeah, it looks it looks really, really it's nice. like a place someone might actually want to spend time as opposed to like, descending into the dungeon, descending into the abyss. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, speaking of spending time, like we, we were talking to, um, you know, to to one of the guys there who was, um, he, he was kind of helping us out. He's the guy who got us access to the trading floor. And um, he was saying that people, um, people get jobs there and they just never leave. Like some of the people were down there trading on the floor when you and I were there, Mark. And, you know, there were a couple young faces but like he was like, yeah, they're gonna be here for twenty years. What when when someone dies, a spot opens up. I was gonna say they're gonna drop on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about it, man. Like you know, like there's no more, you know, getting a job as a clerk on the floor. Like it just it just don't work that way no more. Ah, uh, yes, reminds me of the old bond pits. If you ever walk by the old board of trade bond pits, it's shall we say some aged fellows hanging out talking about yesteryear <laughs> a lot of that good stuff speaking of good stuff you guys covered a lot of ground here in this survey i'm, I'm just going through a few things uh, interesting stuff here your audience is the u.s in a recession 69 percent saying yes 31 percent saying no i'll get to what our audience is saying in a little bit we have that exact question of the week going right now listeners also, you're, they're kind of mixed on market direction. It looks like they're kind of 50-50 split on whether the S&P and the NASDAQ will be higher or lower in Q4, which is kind of interesting. Again, it also makes a market. Uh, but I want to get into some of the other interesting nuggets we mentioned here. Like you said, some of the, the lifespan of these traders, 54% have been trading more than five years. That's interesting. Uh, that's very much in line with our audience. You know, We do see the lion's share are still the kind of super active, super hardcore folks who've been doing it for quite a while, but also... As we say, there's new people discovering this show, discovering the network, discovering just the world of options in general, literally every day these days. And so seeing the newcomers, that new bleeding edge, unlike the trading floor, which is kind of atrophying, we're seeing our audiences continuing, the average age continuing to get lower as new folks are just continuing to pour into this market. In fact, Dan and I will be discussing some of those new folks tomorrow on a panel for the Harvard Business School. Should be kind of fun. So stay tuned. Look out for that, listeners, if you are intrigued. But interesting stuff here. Also, this other question caught my eye, Dan. I like your thoughts on it because this is something you and I, I think, just talked about recently. On the, we had a question about this, which uh, maybe it was with Brian. I lose track of so many shows. But someone wrote in with a question about how much time should they spend on their trading if they really want to make it into a, a decent, maybe not a full-time job. We get that question a lot. But like a decent side hustle, if you will, a decent side income stream. What did your respondents say in terms of how much time they spend trading? Sir? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So uh, let's see here. Um, where did it go? Where did it go? Yeah. So I, I, I started talking about this a little bit. Uh, how much time do you spend per day trading? And man, this is like, <clears throat> it's almost the bell curve. Uh, it's a little bit skewed to the lower side, but but 36% are one to three hours a day. Um, well, here, let's start. Let's start from the low end. 18.49 are less than 30 minutes a day. 
21.92% are 30 minutes to an hour a day. 36.3% are one to three hours. Uh, 10.96% trade half the day, and then the remaining 12.33% spend more than half the day. Now, that said, like, you know, let's back up for a minute. Like, I, I, I know personally many of our students, like, you know, we're not just like some, you know, we're not the Walmart of trading education. Like, I, I care very personally about the results of our students, so I get to know many of them. And the reason why I would say we got some of these results is because <clears throat> there are some folks in our community who, you know, they're retired and this is what they want to do. And, you know, I mean, some of them have gone on to become full time uh, traders. Some of them who are, you know, younger, not retired, went on to become professional traders. And, and though, you know, the people who have that luxury where they have that time during the day, you know, they fill it trading because they can make money. But, you know, there's a lot of people in our community who, you know, work out in Silicon Valley or, you know, um, work on telephone wires. We had one of those guys. He's like, man, I can't sit in front of my computer all day. I'm literally out in the field climbing telephone poles, hooking up wires. And um, he he put in the effort and he was like, yeah, I can spend about an hour a day intermittently when I come down for my break, I can put in my orders before the open. I can check them, you know, on my break and then on my lunch, my other break, and then look at stuff when the market's closed and make that work. So a lot of the answer to that is lifestyle dependent, I would say. Um, with anything, the more you put in, the more you get out. But you put in what you can and you figure out a way to make it work. And, and, and man, people make it work. Yeah, that was an interesting debate that Brian and I had recently on OPR about how much really should people expect in terms of time to be putting in. We kind of came down on that one hour level seems to be a pretty good barometer for people where if you're looking to make this obviously not a full time gig, obviously people have jobs, they have lives there, they can't spend, you know, three to six hours a day every day looking at their screens, right? Uh, but an hour a day that, inc that includes, you know, your trading time, actually looking at the screens, planning your trades, researching. And then also maybe some other time, maybe on your commute, maybe it's listening to a podcast like this, maybe it's watching videos, maybe it's going to your broker and looking at their educational content, something to up your game a bit to educate yourself about things you're still not sure about or don't really understand in the world of options. That also counts in that one hour there as well. So try to get something going where you can engage with these markets somewhere around one hour a day. That seems to be a good a good starting point, Dan. Is that kind of your takeaway as well? They can manage to get an hour a day in. It doesn't have to be all at the same time, but they can get that hour a day in. That's kind of a good starting point, Dan. If you can get that out, that one hour a day in, and it like, you know, part of trading is planning, uh, you know, and looking what to watch and set up. So it doesn't even all have to be during market hours. But if you can get that one hour a day in, I have seen traders. At, you know, become very, very consistent. Another question we get a lot is, you know, how much money do I need to trade these freaking options things, Dan? And you took a survey on this as well. Yeah. So this one, it was pretty across the board. I mean, the biggest, the biggest category we had was 50 to 100 grand. But if we just go and, you know, the listeners, uh, you know, being an audio podcast, you're going to have to um, think uh, in your mind's eye here. We, we had like 2% who are less than $1,000 because, you know, we've definitely had people who started out with $1,000, but it's tough. It's better to be a little bit more capitalized. So we have 10.5%, 1 to 5,000, 7%, 5 to 10,000, 10 to 25% is. 14 and a half percent, or wait a minute, 14 and a half was 10 to 25,000, 12 percent was 25 to 50,000, 16 percent 50 to 100, 14 and a half 100 to 250, 10 and a half 250 to 500, 3 and a half percent was 500 to a million, and then 9 percent of our respondees. Uh, their account size is over a million. So yeah, you don't need to to bring the size dollars. 
<laughs> out there, listeners, in terms of how much money you need to bring to the table. But the more, obviously, the better. If you can trade more things, you're not just locked in. It is challenging if you have about a thousand bucks. It is kind of challenging to get the ball rolling on some of these strategies. Some of the things we talk about, like cash secured puts or things like that, are going to require some capital to put aside to do them. A lot of the premium harvesting strategies are going to require some capital. But you don't need a million dollars to get the ball rolling as well. And these results show it as well. You know, the largest individual sector is 50 to 100 grand. And that's a lot of money, obviously, but it's, it's doable, certainly more doable than, than it is on the 1 million side. Uh, Dan, I think we're preaching to the choir here with what assets do they trade. But nonetheless, what do they choose for that, sir? Okay, so the assets. <laughs> so, yeah, this is um, <clears throat> this is an interesting one. We've got a lot of results here, so I have to do a lot of scrolling here. Um, and I think mine are in a little bit of a different order than yours. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> so go figure, 90.3% trade options. And now these are not mutually exclusive results here. Um, so it, it's not going to be a surprise here to say that 82.76% also trade stocks. Uh, 58% also trade ETFs, and then 20.5% trade crypto, which is interesting. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're actively trading every single day or anything, but I imagine they, you know, have a Coinbase account or, or you know, some, some I know for sure are more active with that. <clears throat> you know, some have mutual funds, some have bonds. I think that obviously those are investments as opposed to trades but um yeah and the other please specify uh let's see what were the other please specify ones oh gold uh cfds uh bond futures futures currency and uh commodities yeah 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 so basically futures and forex uh, and yeah, futures and forex, basically. All right, let's keep on going with some of these other results here. Uh, how do they prefer to learn about their trading strategies and tools, Dan? You gave them a bunch of choices for how they engage with their content. What do they What do they say for that, sir? Yeah, so the um, you know the the question that I answered before was online, and so I think that that's where a lot of this is coming from. So. The biggest thing is webinars or or online trainings. 63.7% were that. And you know, these these again, they're not mutually exclusive. They you could answer these questions more than once. Um on demand courses as well, which is part of a lot of our trainings, you know, like our our credit spread genius and time spread genius that just came out like they get the alerts from the exchange, but <clears throat> we want to make sure they deeply understand time spreads and credit spreads. So there's on-demand courses that come with it. Uh, 19% uh, prefer one-on-one -on -one coaching, which, you know, I tell people it's not for everybody. You know, it's, it's for the people who are, you know, who are really more serious and want to shortcut the amount of time, you know, like... People, people can do live webinars, on-demand courses, uh, you know, YouTube, 30% you, said YouTube. I mean, to be fair, every once in a while, if I'll be wondering about something, I might look at YouTube, but oh my goodness, there's so many, so much terrible and wrong information on YouTube. I try and tell people not to do that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you can look at the on-demand courses, the live webinars you know, sift through troves and, and troves of crappy YouTube videos to find something that actually is accurate and can actually help you. Or you can just say, hey, I'm going to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And it's like all dedicated exactly to you. We skip over all the stuff you already know. And, um, you know, teach you the stuff that for your personal trading style situation, capitalization goals, uh, you know, get you to the to your goals faster. And so, yeah, 19, 20 percent, you know, they just choose to go that route and, and hit the easy button. 
All right, and then let's get into some of the what your folks think is what's going to happen to the market. What are the chances the S and P five hundred will close the year at or above four thousand? Mister Dan, what what does your audience say for that? What are the chances that the S and P five hundred will close the year at or above four thousand? All right. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. It is literally about split 50-50. I mean, it's like right down the middle. Um, Wowsies. Now, if you ask me, you know, I mean, we just did this survey, what, a couple of weeks ago. If you ask me, that's a little, that's a little bit bullish, I would say, right? Because when we did this survey, we were, you know, a fair amount, uh, 25% or whatever, below 4,000. So for 50% of the people to say, you know, just think about this like like you would the delta of an option, right? <laughs> we're looking at the delta of the of the 4,000 strike, um, pretty far out of the money calls. And my my people are assigning a 50 delta to that. You know, that being said, in our classes, I do like to sort of uh, try and try and exude a lot of positivity, you know, as much as I can um, and, and not necessarily paint a rosy picture about the market, but just positivity about self, you know, uh, try and try and get our people thinking positive. Like I can do this because everybody knows, you know, uh, Henry Ford said it best, right? Uh, whether you think you can do something or can't do something, you're right, <laughs> right? Um, so that's maybe that's where a little bit of the uh, optimism comes from with our group, or you know maybe they're just um, m- maybe maybe it comes from the research too. It's hard to say. Actually, this is kind of an interesting one too. You asked them. This is the question we get a lot from people on all shows: is our favorite brokers. Which brokers do we like? out there dan you took this same question to your audience they seem kind of evenly split across the board sir what were some of the results from this one yeah so this one uh think or swim with td ameritrade was was the biggest category here that was about 38 percent um <clears throat> and then fidelity was about 18 percent uh interactive brokers was 10.3% and Charles Schwab was 6.9% he trade 5.5% and here's the thing like i would say that like i think it's important to look at this you know just to get a feel for what's going on in the world and 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 that's what these results in my opinion really represent I don't think that it's a referendum on which one is better. I think that it's simply a cross section of, hey, here's what people are doing. And so, like, therefore, it's not a surprise because TD Ameritrade was 90 some percent of my people trade options. TD Ameritrade was the biggest options broker in the world by far, just squelching the rest of them. And that was before this recent merger, right? So like they're giants. In fact, I'm surprised, honestly, that more people aren't on that platform just because that's that's where most options traders are housed by and large. But, um, you know, Fidelity is is a great option trading firm. And, um, you know, I mean, IB has a lot of great tools. Just their customer service makes you want to put a bullet in your head. Um but yeah, it's uh, yeah that 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 was a pretty good and interesting cross section for sure. I like how you uh, break up Schwab and which is kind of the, the juggernaut now and Fidelity. We've had all of them on the network represented in one way, shape, or form over the the fifteen plus year history. E Trade, uh, IB, Thinkorswim, uh, all sorts of Thinkorswim is now obviously part of the the Schwab juggernaut, but. It's kind of its own separate thing. Before we get into some questions, Dan, any other salient results or highlights or maybe surprises from your survey that you want to share with our audience? Oh, yeah. 
what stock or ETF, and this is, you did a survey like this recently too. Um, I, I gave some more choices here, but which stock or ETF do you think will have the highest percentage gain in value in the fourth quarter? And <laughs> so remember, this is a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks, three weeks ago, something like that. Tesla was the biggest one. So far, that's going against them. But uh, Q4 sure is not over. We're In fact, we're only like not even three weeks into it. Apple was second with 21%. XOM, ExxonMobil, was about 19%. And then everything else after that is pretty pretty across the board. And that that's not very surprising. Yeah, I, uh, oh, Amazon was 11%. That, w- that one kind of surprises me a little bit. I think it might be tough for Amazon to uh, be have the highest percentage gain in the fourth quarter with interest rates rising. Um, let me let me just look and see if there's one more. There were a couple other real interesting things here. Oh yeah, which sectors? Ooh, so this is a good one too. Lots of nuggets. Which sectors do you think will have the highest percentage gain in value in the fourth quarter? Energy, by and large, the highest, forty percent, and and then twenty one percent said technology which I feel like is a little bit surprising because technology tends to get hurt in rising interest rate environments. Um, and then after that, the next one was consumer staples, which, you know, that those are cyclicals. And so I'm not surprised by those. Um, so, yeah, that's been interesting. Um, what do you think the unemployment rate will be for the December report? <laughs> So we've got like almost a perfect log normal distribution here with 4% being the uh, median in this distribution. Uh, 26% of our people thought that 4% would be the unemployment rate for the December report. Um, and then, then you know, that strike is pretty well straddled. 3.5% was 19% of our people. And fourteen uh, percent of our people said four and a half percent. So there, I mean, right there, we've got almost, you know, almost everybody who responded was between three and a half and four and a half. Um, let me just give one more, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the crude oil, uh, you know, the crude oil one. Uh, where will crude be at the end of the year? Most people said ninety bucks a barrel. We we had some outliers there too. Some people said 18% said 90 bucks a barrel. 7% said 100 bucks a barrel. 7% said 80 bucks a barrel. That was an interesting one. We had some good outliers there. Oh, 6% said over $110 a barrel. Um, and that. Okay, wait, one more, one more. This is fun. I like doing this. <laughs> what do you think the Fed funds target rate will be on December 31st? Man, there were some optimistic folks there. This was kind of a little bit across the board too. There was only there was only about 22 21% saying above 375 basis points. So there was a lot of optimism of of rates coming down a little bit. I don't know if I see that happen. Okay, okay. That being said, um, we're probably a little bit over time here anyway. So let, let me pass the torch. I love talking about this stuff. Oh, you know, one more thing before I do pass the torch. For those of you who um, who find this interesting, we, we, we're doing this every quarter now. and you guys who listen to this show, Options Bootcamp, we would love to have you participate too. And really, all you have to do is go to markettaker.com slash join free. And uh, you know, we send you an email asking for your opinions on this stuff. That's going to be coming out in about another month and a half. So um, we would really love to hear from you as well. There we go. Speaking of hearing from folks, let's get to some of you on the show right now. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All 
All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's hear from our listeners. Dan, speaking of your survey results, let's get to ours because I mentioned earlier in the show that a significant chunk of your audience, 69% said the U.S. is in a recession right now. Well, great minds think alike, Dan, because that is our question of the week this week as well. We're asking you a recession, usually defined as two quarters of negative GDP growth, at least it was when I was studying econ back in the day, seems like definitions are getting a little wishy-washy these days. Uh, but we thought we'd put the question to you folks. Quite simply, is our economy in a recession right now? Heck yes, heck no, or we need a new definition. Dan, what is your vote? Do you agree with your audience that we're in a recession? And then B, what do you think our audience is voting for? Well, yeah, I mean, I, we are in a recession by the traditional definition. Somewhere along the lines... They changed it. And, you know, some people who like to politicize things, uh, you know, blame whoever, you know, for that. And I don't know, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's not. But yeah, I mean, we are in a recession. And but, you know, like the thing is, is take that with a grain of salt, because, you know, a recession is just a word that has this definition. It doesn't mean that the sky is falling. It doesn't mean you're going to lose your job. It doesn't mean the stock market is even necessarily going to go down. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, it just means there are two quarters of GD, of, of negative GDP in a row. Uh, that is the traditional definition. And that has happened. And, th- and that's all it means. So, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Don't, don't, you know, run around with your head cut off because we're in a recession. But um, that's what I say. And I think that our audience, I, I would say most of them would say that. I I, I bet, and I, I'm not looking at at any results. I don't know if they're out there on Twitter or not. I would say at least 75% of the people say that. Well, you, our audience agrees with your audience, sir. Heck yes, 79.2%. Yes. Yes, a, a strong agreement. Twelve and a half percent say we need a new definition of of uh, of recession. Hey, maybe we do. If if no one wants to admit we're in one, then maybe we need a a, a stronger, sterner, stricter definition, or maybe just a more wishy washy one so folks can skate around it like they're kind of doing right now. And then heck no, Dan, eight point three percent, the diehard saying no, we are not in recession. Apparently, I'm not sure what they're waiting for, but they they have not seen yet enough to declare that we are in. A recession. Get over there at options, listeners. You got a couple of days left. It is our question of the week. After all, it's also pay off last week's question of the week. Uh, we asked you if you had to buy a 10% out of the money call expiring at the end of the year on one of these underlyings, which one would it be? Kind of analogous to what Dan was talking about with picking different uh, sectors. I uh, gave you four choices VIX, so volatility itself, Bitcoin, crude oil, or the SPX. 34% of you choosing SPX. And I should know that was the old that was the old results back in January. We asked you that question back in January it was thirty four percent. When we asked you again just last week, an updated version of that poll, fifty percent of you chose the SPX. So roughly three hundred sixty points in the S. Uh, crude oil coming in at number two, WTI somewhere around nine to ten handles, depending on where WTI is floating that day, eight to ten. And then uh, Bitcoin eight point eight percent, and VIX also eight point eight percent. So we had a tie for the bottom of our poll out there. Uh, let's get out to this one here as well. Uh, this one comes from CCDC, Mr. Dan. It says, I've heard it said on this show that Delta Neutral is not recommended for retail traders, uh, but I regularly use options to mitigate the deltas of my positions using spreads. Is this not Delta Neutral trading? Can you discuss this on the program? Yeah, Dan, you and I have said before on the show that Delta neutral is not exactly recommended for retail for a variety of reasons. It's cash intensive, requires a large account, requires very favorable margin treatment. You know, you're buying options, selling stock or futures, whatever the case may be, against it. So obviously that ties up a lot of capital. It's expensive and usually retail accounts are not operating on the scale and the margin necessary to make this type of trading really profitable. But Dan, he says... What about instead of using stock, he uses options against his options, and he calls that delta neutral, sir. What do you say about that? And also the fact that maybe he's putting some other Greeks with his delta neutralness here. Yeah, so CCDC. Um, yeah, I mean, you can call that delta neutral. I mean, if you if you are intentionally creating a position that has a delta that is near zero, 
that's delta neutral. So sure, uh, I'll, I'll give you that. What Mark and I typically uh, have meant in the past when we, we've talked about it is like gamma scalping uh, delta neutral, like basically buying a synthetic straddle, you know, having positive gamma and when the stock goes up short stock, when the stock goes down buy stock, try and cut your time decay and then some. That's mainly what we have meant when we talked about that. Um, so maybe a more narrow definition that we're talking about here. And that is pretty darn tough for retail traders, especially if you have just a reg T account and not portfolio margining. Um, but, you know, like doing what you're doing, if that's working for you and it's part of your holistic trading plan and you're making money from it, please don't stop doing it. Right. Um, but if you're like tinkering around with it and like you find yourself not really making or losing money because your deltas are flat, then, then maybe you're just messing around too much. I, I, I don't know your situation. Um, I think. The, a typical retail trader does not use options to mitigate deltas, but you know they just trade more straight strategies like debit spreads, credit spreads, butterflies, whatever. But hey, man, if it works, don't stop doing it. Keep doing it. If you like it, don't stop. And just remember, you're not technically doing delta neutral. I mean, the reason we say delta neutral when you're hedging with stock and underlying is underlying only has a delta. So you're taking that delta away, but you're leaving the rest of your creeks. When you're trading other options against your options, you're kind of legging into spreads now. So that's a little bit of a different beast. You can maybe get your delta down to zero, but you're also going to impact your gamma. You're going to impact your data. You're going to impact your vega and everything else, all the other Greeks that go along with that position. So just remember that. Stock doesn't have those Greek components. So you're just taking away the directional risk. You're leaving everything else on that hopefully you can maybe gamma scalp against or, or things like that. But it's a different beast when you're doing this. But as Dan said, if you, if it is working for you, who are we to naysay you out there? If it's working for you, keep it up. Just remember, you're not, it's not quite. It's kind of more of a, not even a poor man's. It's just a different type of trading. But technically, I suppose it is delta neutral. An intriguing question there, CCDC. That music means we've come to the end of this very wide-ranging episode. Talked about all different aspects of the world of options and what you folks think and what a lot of Dan's people think. It's just been a fun one. Uh, Mr. Dan, before we go, sir, folks want to check out the full results for themselves of your survey. Or maybe they want to become a part of the next survey. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, make your way on over to markettaker.com, two T's in a row, and, and just click join fleet. Join, easy, again, easy for me to say. I'm stealing your line, Mark. Um, and um, click join free, and that puts you on our list to get all of our goodies, uh, complimentary webinars and, you know, survey results and lots of really great stuff. And um, we, we, we'd love to have you join us. Check them out. MarketTaker2Ts.com is the place to go. Listeners, we got to get on out of here. Uh, Brian would coming at you live to tape. So on the on-demand side, all you on-demand folks will get OPR coming at you later on this afternoon. And then, of course, we're back with our regular slate of programming tomorrow, this week in Futures Option and the, and the Option Block. Friday, Volatility Views. And, of course, after that, for all you cool cats in the Secret Club, Options Oddities. Then back again next week with the option block on Monday and the crypto rundown Tuesday again to the pro folks with our pro Q and a sessions. And then back again, next education Wednesday, another episode of options bootcamp. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the options insider radio network, the home of the options podcast. For more quality options programs, visit the options or search for options insider radio network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.